welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about Hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I am so excited for our conversation today, and we're going to be talking about Beckel that is really ready to kind of take over the U.S. market. It is very simple and yet so profound in terms of what it does to help us understand dementia. But before I go there, I always like to first welcome you to the show. For those of you that are new, I'm Lori LeBay, and my mom lived with dementia for 30 years, and that's why I do what I do. That's why Alzheimer's Speaks was started. Uh, It's really important for me personally to connect people to services, products, and tools that I think will ease their journey Uh, because I know our family had a really difficult time maneuvering everything. Also, if you liked our opening song, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band. And if you haven't checked out our new website, our main website is alzheimerspeaks.com. Please go there. We have one page that is dedicated just to all the free resources we provide you. Plus, we have pages if you're interested in branding and marketing or speaking. I also want to mention a couple of support groups and events that I have coming up. Arthur's Memory Cafe is held virtually the second and fourth Wednesday of each month from one to three o'clock. And uh, you are welcome to join us there. I also facilitate a support group sponsored by Brookdale North Oaks, which is held out of the Shoreview Community Center the last Wednesday of each month from 10 to 11. That also provides respite care for uh, those living with dementia so that the care partners can meet individually as well. And then on September 20th from 6.30 to 7.30 Eastern Time, Artist Senior Living is sponsoring a webinar called Realities of Dementia. And there I'm gonna give people uh, family-friendly tips and tools that I know that will be useful. I know I sure found them useful on my journey as well. And then on October 31st, I'll be in person doing a screening of A Timeless Love with the dementia-friendly group in Minnetonka, Minnesota. So if any of those sound of interest, please reach out to me at radio at alzheimerspeaks.com. And two other companies I just want to mention. One is Saltbox TV. It's a free online streaming service designed specifically for seniors, has lots of great old films and TV shows, but also has a lot of education and wellness programs. And then of course, Dementia Map, where we are connecting people globally on services, products, and tools, and that is totally free access. We're going to hear from the Adaptive Equipment and Caregiving Corner, and we'll be right back. I love the Footbar Walker, and let me tell you why. It is the option for my toolbox that I've been waiting for. Let's be honest. There are some clients who, despite our best rehab efforts, just aren't able to return to performing a sit-to-stand transfer on their own. Now I can offer my caregivers an easier, safer option that doesn't involve hoisting their loved one up from a sitting position. I don't recommend this walker for all of my clients, but I do recommend this walker for those caregivers looking for an easier, safer option with transfers. I would also encourage other therapists to add this walker to their toolbox. It's kind of like having my own mobile parallel bars for the client to pull up on. Whether it's a family caregiver at home helping a loved one with Parkinson's or dementia, CNAs in a long-term care facility assisting their patients, or therapists adapting to client and caregiver-specific needs, we now have a very safe and effective option to offer in the Footbar Walker. Check this product out at thefootbarwalker.com. That's it for today from Adaptive Equipment and Caregiving Corner. Have a great day, and don't forget, if you can't do it, adapt it. Okay, we are back and I want to introduce you to Cindy Hunt-Levinsky, who is an advanced practice nurse. 
and she is the first accredited speckle practitioner in North America. And she was credentialed by the Contented Dementia Trust in England. Cindy has a nursing background that ranges from critical care to community case management. She does what she does in honor of her dad. And she founded and currently serves as the executive director of Dementia Together, which is a nonprofit organization in Northern Colorado, which offers education, enrichment, and hope all while cultivating joy and building stronger connections for people living with dementia, their care partners in the community as a whole. Cindy is a true leader in the Dementia Friendly Community Initiatives. She facilitates care partner support groups and works with her Dementia Together team to provide dementia friendly education and more than 300 in person and online memory cafes. She advocates for community collaboration to make living with dementia the expectation, not the exception. So Cindy, I love having you on the show. So I really appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy you are. Uh, it's amazing all the work you guys are doing with dementia together. So again, thanks. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> now, you know, I mentioned to people that you're, you know, you do what you do in honor of your dad, but why don't you tell people a little bit more about him and, and what got you into this mode? Sure. My dad was a trout researcher for the state of Wisconsin for many years. He did trout stream habitat improvement. He got awards all over the country for his research. And I, the Trout Unlimited friends would say, oh, your dad was a legendary fly fisherman. To which I'm like, well, yeah, he knew where to fly fish because he did all the trout stream habitat improvement. But uh, he, I say he's even a better dad than he was a trout fisherman. And he, just this brilliant guy, and as researchers are. And so when he developed symptoms of dementia, it was really frustrating for him. And the day that just changed the whole trajectory of my life was when he said to me, Cindy, I can't multitask anymore. I can't seem to focus. And I feel like I'm living in a fog. And those are words I'll never forget. Because as a nurse case manager at the time, out in the community, I had a geriatric caseload. I wasn't passionate about dementia until that moment. And that was the moment when I thought, okay, my dad has really lived well. And it became an overriding passion to help for me to help him finish well. And so I just studied all sorts of person-centered care methods of dementia care. I didn't even know that so many existed. And um, that's what really got me into finding out about contented dementia and into this whole idea that, oh, well, people actually can live well with dementia and he is going to be able to finish well, but it's going to be up to me and the people around him to make that happen. Yeah. Well, and through your research, you know, that's kind of how we got connected. If I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. you reached out to me because I was out there blabbering, kind of doing, doing the same thing. Like I got to make this world better for my mom. You know, where is everybody? Yes. <laughs> See, where are all these resources? Um, you started, you know, your own dementia friendly community. Why don't you give people just a little snippet of why that was so important for you as well? Yeah. So my dad was uh, still alive and I started a care partner support group at our church. And then some of our care partners thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to bring our loved ones? So then we started a memory cafe. And from that, there was a group in our community that wanted to start a B Sharp Arts Engagement Program with the Fort Collins Symphony. And with that, 30 couples were able to attend the Fort Collins Symphony. Their tickets were underwritten. They were part of a study at Colorado State University looking at their sense of connection, their mood, and actually their cognition. And even though people living with dementia as a progressive process, um, they actually showed an improvement in cognition while they were involved in that study. So that was this community effort of a lot of groups um, just working together and the energy for that was so high that they said, well, what's next? And that's where I'd been kind of sitting on my hands for 18 months saying, well, what's next is we need to do dementia friendly communities. We need to do some business training in the communities. And um, so that's, then we 
launched into that, we launched into uh, more memory cafes and really from our advisory board, which is people living with dementia and their care partners. Um, we also started this patient resource folder that we give to medical providers in Northern Colorado. And so that hopefully we're changing the way people get a diagnosis. So rather than saying, yeah, you have dementia related to whatever, come back and see me in a year. Um, hopefully it's becoming increasingly more common that people here in Northern Colorado, they may get a dementia related diagnosis, but they also should get a resource folder with information that doesn't just contain dementia together information, but it contains a lot of the community resource information on one page because we don't wanna overwhelm people. It contains a one page tip sheet for a person with dementia and a one page tip sheet for a care partner, again, because they're overwhelmed, let's keep it simple. And then just pocket cards for each of them to share. Either I'm living with dementia, your patience is appreciated, or my companion's living with dementia, your patience is appreciated. And then also all the activities that they can get involved in so that they know right away from the get-go, they don't have to walk this journey alone. So that's kind of, we, we kind of hit it from all sides. We've done healthcare education, senior healthcare education, care partner education. We've increasingly been getting into more law enforcement education as well. And specifically we teach from the contented dementia approach, which is different from what other groups in the Northern Colorado use um, and that helps us not duplicate services for each other. It's amazing all you've accomplished. I, I'm so excited that you're getting those patient folders out, but I'm still kind of almost irritated that others aren't doing that. It, it's, it's the not critical hard. point that everybody complains about that they they don't get resources and why those connections aren't being made to me is is unreal. It, it's just it's almost uh, in some ways unforgivable because it, 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 it makes the start of the journey so different. Yeah. And when, when you feel that there's help there in every community, I don't care big or small, if you've got a dementia friendly community or not, there is still a way to get this information to people because everything doesn't have to be in your backyard. If you don't have a movement yet, right in your community. And so I just have to like, punch that one out because it, that is just so important. There's so many virtual opportunities too. And if people like you are listed on that resource, Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's no reason for people to think, oh, we're the only ones going through this. We can't talk about it. We'll have to whisper the word dementia. I mean, all of that you can get rid of right away. If you just let people know that they have hope. That well, they're not and and just, you know, to allow people to breathe through this process instead of hyperventilate the whole way from, mm -hmm. you know, I don't care if you're the one getting the diagnosis or if you're sitting alongside supporting them. I mean, it, it does, it takes your breath away and it's like, mm -hmm. what do we do now? And there's no answers really for the most part, typically at the doctor's office, except here's another, here's another appointment. And, and if you'd like a prescription, I mean, a lot of them don't even get, you know, the Alzheimer's association number. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much information all around the world that can help. And I love that you're working with law enforcement. I think that that is just, I mean, we've, we've seen and heard all kinds of horrible stories out there. And so I'm, I'm thrilled with that. But today we're really going to focus on this con contented dementia that you're doing. And now you went over to England to, to learn about this, if I'm not mistaken, is that correct? Yeah. So yeah talk so about committed daughter. <laughs> <laughs> well, three weeks after dad told me about his symptoms, I started, I, I read about speckle and which looks like special misspelled, but it's not, it's speckle. And I found out that Penny Garner who developed it was gonna be in London when I was in London. So she sat down with me at a bakery for three hours and told me all about it. And then I've since gone back and studied with her and honestly have been studying with her for the past 13 years. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> and I learn from her every single time I talk to her every couple of weeks. Um, but she shared with me the, the speckle method. Um, it helped give me hope that it, my dad was going to be able to finish well. And I wondered why doesn't everybody know about this approach? It's so simple. And as a nurse, I'm like, well, why didn't we learn this in nursing school? 
<laughs> kind of like you, why doesn't everybody give out the boulders? <laughs> yep. Well, it is. And, and when you find something that's simple to apply and understand, it just shifts everything. Mm -hmm. And not only does it make it better for the person with dementia, but for those who are caring for them. I mean, it, it changes everything yeah. when you have a true understanding of what is going on and alternative ways to respond, yeah. you know, to, to be able to create that, that joy and still, you know, feel those relationships. And I think that that is, um, one of the things I adore so much about you and the work that you do is everything comes from your heart and you, you know, you really are out to improve the world. You really are a true thought leader. And I, I don't think you get recognized near as much as you should for all you have done. I mean, it, it really is incredible <laughs> what, what you and your team have accomplished. And, you know, as much as, um, you know, I wouldn't wish this disease on my mom or your dad. It's like, I I'm thankful that it landed in our arenas mm -hmm. to be able to make a difference. And, and, you know, anybody can step in and step up at all different types of levels to improve the, the trajectory of this, of this journey for families. So Cindy, I'd love for you to introduce the speckle program to our audience. I think it's just so powerful. And like you said, it's, it's simple. And when it's simple, it just changes everything in terms of how we, how we interact, how we react, um, and, and how we can avoid some situations that we keep walking into over and over again, because we don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the speckle method is rooted in person-centered care. Like a lot of other person-centered care models, it's all about learning from the expert. The person with dementia is the expert. It's about what do we need to do, the people without dementia, to help this person live well. And it's really focusing on their strengths. What can somebody with dementia still do? The difference, I think, from speckle compared to other methods is that you don't need absolutely no biomedical knowledge of dementia. Um, I don't really care what kind of dementia you have because we're, we're treating dementia as simply the disability of no longer efficiently storing the facts of what has just occurred while still storing the feelings in the same way. So even though that's an oversimplification of dementia, when we treat it as if facts are randomly, intermittently, and with increasing frequency, not storing for somebody with dementia, but yet the feelings about their experiences are still storing, it changes how we interact with them. And so we use what we call the speckle photograph album to explain that. And with this analogy, every experience we have is stored as a photograph in our albums. And every photograph contains the facts, as you can see kind of the light color here, of what just occurred and the associated feelings, surrounded by the feelings. So the taking and storing of these photographs is an automatic unconscious process going on in the background of our lives. It's unobserved by us and unobservable by anybody else at the time of storage. So as time goes by, page after page after page of these photographs build up in our albums and our albums fall open naturally on today's page. And this is where the latest photographs are flying in. And it's this latest information that we must have if we're gonna make sense of what are we doing? Who are we with? You know, Where are we? Why are we here? So we consult our albums all the time. So every time we have a let me think moment, using this analogy, it's let me think, let me look in my album for a fact I need to help me make sense of what's going on in my life. We even use these albums in normal communication every day. So anytime we're asked a question, we don't just know the answer. We have to consult our album first before we can actually even give an answer. And the example I often use is if somebody asks me, would I like a cup of coffee? Well, would I like a cup of coffee? It all depends. Let me think, let me look in my album. Would I be the only one drinking coffee? Or I might even ask myself, have I just had coffee? I have to ask myself an additional question before I can give a response. So every question drives us to our album 
so that we can answer questions or so that we can have a conversation. We build on what, what is in our own albums. So with statements and questions, we're always consulting our albums. We spend a lot of time in our classes on normal. How do we normally use our albums? Because when we understand normal, then we understand dementia. And let me hop into dementia right away though, because we're you're not gonna be here for three hours. <laughs> so with dementia, a different kind of a photograph is taken and stored. And you can see how it looks different. So in this new type of photograph, it's a fact-free, feelings-only, dementia-related photograph, and we call it a blank, but we just mean blank in terms of facts. The feelings, you can see, take up all the space where the facts would normally have stored. And at first, it might look like an occasional blip of lost factual information, but further blanks will follow. Dementia is pro progressive. And they're, they're going to follow randomly, intermittently, and with increasing frequency, and eventually people end up with ribbons of blanks. And this might be about the time somebody actually gets a diagnosis, because now other people are noticing <laughs> there are some blanks storing in the album for a person with dementia. Really, until the end of time, more and more feelings-only blanks will store but always interrupted by an occasional random normal facts and feelings photograph. And you've, you've seen this with your own mom. Yep. Like people can live for a long time where only feelings are storing. But every once in a while, there's this random normal photograph that stores and you're like, whoa, where'd that come from? <laughs> Yeah, and, we, and we're like, oh, that that moment of clarity. Yeah, appeared. It's like, how did they how did they grab a hold of that? Right. And yeah. this, I think that this analogy just helps us see so easily, black in black and white in this case, why feelings become so much more important than facts for somebody with dementia, and why we, if our albums look like this, we're the ones that have to do the changing. We're mm -hmm. the ones that whenever we're giving a response to somebody who has a blanking album page, we had better give a response that makes sense to them given what's storing on their page versus insisting that, no, you must go with what I know to be actually factually true. Mm -hmm. We need to be humble enough to say, oh, what response is gonna create the most well-being given what is storing for my loved one on, their, on today's page or on surrounding pages? So that's where um, this analogy is so helpful. And it, we go more into it, but that's kind of an in introductory um, to at least the photograph album analogy and why it's helpful in, in helping us realize we're the ones that have to change how we interact. Well, what I find interesting is, is using that analogy that the album is the brain and you know the feelings, feelings wrap every experience we have. I mean, they, they're, they're the package, you know, mm -hmm. and is it a, is it a pretty bow or was it tossed around by the UPS guy? <laughs> you know, I mean, right. it will make a difference in terms of how you feel. And those facts, as much as we try to force them on someone, I think what most of us aren't realizing is we're getting our level of comfort from those facts. And, right. and that's why we're kind of hell bound on no, this right or wrong attitude. And I know for me with my mom, and it took me a while to kind of learn this because there was nobody teaching this stuff out there at all. It was, it really came down to how does she feel? Yeah. You know, person-centered care, relationship-based care is about making them feel comfortable because they, they, they don't have the adaptability that we do. They right. don't have necessarily, and again, depending on where somebody is in the, in the process with this, I, that's just critical. And then, you know, when you're able to let go of that, all of a sudden you're more comfortable. You're not in conflict, trying to fix it, pull them back to right or wrong and all of those types of things. And I just found so much comfort coming out of that whole style approach. And it's like, it, it to me it light it lightened the burden of giving care it enhanced my relationship on multiple levels and I, are you your head shaking but 
I'm, I'm getting the feeling, you know, you're, you feel that way too about this program. It does, it does lighten your load as a care partner, mm -hmm. because now that you are focused on how do I boost the well being for my loved one who hasn't really lost her reasoning capability or desire to reason. She's just lost recent facts with which to reason. So mm -hmm. when she's matching back to pre-dementia pages to try to give herself context to make sense of what's happening, that's where care partners can listen so carefully to what, what are they matching back to? How is this making sense to them? How can I then help this make sense to them using what they're giving me? They're the experts. Yeah. Um, I just, I was teaching this last week to a group and there was somebody with dementia in the group and she um, stopped me and she said, this makes so much sense because when our family goes camping, I can recall the feelings of the camping trip, but I don't have any of the facts to know what we did. And so she'll look at the picture even of the trip and the feelings come back that they had such a lovely time. But of course, those details, if they didn't store, they're not in there. But it doesn't matter because she has that feeling of our family had a great time together. And so it, it really helped her even to, to kind of put it into perspective, like maybe our minds normally, we, we are too cluttered with facts, just like you said. And maybe we really were created to connect on that deeper heart and soul level. And if that's what dementia teaches us, <laughs> um, it really is you know, one of the beautiful aspects of dementia that I don't think we should ignore. We talked about um, how dementia, and you've talked about this too, how dementia the, it comes from two Latin words separated from the mind. Mm -hmm. There's nothing about being separated from the soul, separated yeah. from the heart. It's just that, you know, and our friends with dementia will be like, yeah, it feels like my mind's not doing what it's supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and it's funny because when you were talking about that, I, I have always been a person who I've never really, I've never really remembered names. I have never music as much as I, I love music. You can ask people ask all the time, you know, and when you think about it, how many times have you been asked this? What's your favorite song? What's your favorite yeah. band? I can't tell you. I can't even come up with anything. I just know when I hear the music, if I like it or not, I can tell you yeah. if it's a hit, but I have never gathered information in deep in fact on a lot of different areas of my life where I have I have one friend um, who is who has since passed and, and on the speaking circuit and she spoke for gosh 50 years she could go back and I don't care what year it was she would tell you the color of the carpet and the paint and how the room was laid out and you know and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I can't even tell you what city I was in, you know, because yeah. I remember the experience. If I remember the state, I'm doing good. But that's just me. I, I store the emotions. And the so feelings for you, I mean, already. And we, well, that's the beauty. Like if you would get dementia, Lori, those feelings will always continue to store. Yep. Yep. So it's, it's really interesting because I've been like that really yeah. all of my life. And not that I can't remember details uh, at times, but kind of what I consider fluffy stuff yeah. that doesn't like, I, I just don't have time for that. Like don't, don't, clutter. <laughs> don't <laughs> ask me to be on your trivia team unless you want to lose because yeah. I have never, ever been good at that at all. You and I together would be the worst team. Oh ever. my God. <laughs> you know, I want you to um, give us a couple of examples if you and that I think are really common on how the Speckle program could help family and professionals when someone says they want to go home. And the mm -hmm. other one is calling somebody the wrong name. And, you know, we get offended and, and you know, we want to go back to the sticks and bricks home. How does Speckle help us interpret that differently? Well, we go by three golden rules and they're counterintuitive and they don't make a lot of sense unless you know the photograph album analogy, especially the first one, which is don't ask direct questions because the recent facts may not have stored. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we explain that there's a lot of ways to provide choice and to find out answers without asking a direct question that puts somebody on the spot. And I won't go into that now, but... Mm -hmm. um, 
So that's one of the golden rules. The second golden rule is listen to the expert. The person with dementia is the expert. We have to listen to their questions and their phrases. And that's the key with answering your question about what about when my loved one says, I want to go home. If their page is filled with blanks and they're saying, I want to go home, let's listen to the expert. And what they're telling us is they don't feel at home. Home is a feeling. It's all about the feelings. And so our response has to join them in that, consider what their page looks like, figure out what could make it look and feel or what could make it feel more like home for them. And part of the joining with them is like anything else in life, dementia or no dementia. When you have a friend or a companion joining you in that, it's just easier to manage. And so when I want to go home, I want to be where things make sense. And that's really how Speckle defines home. I want to be loved. I want to, I want to know my way around. I want to feel secure. I want all of that. And so with all authenticity, when one of our loved ones wants to go home, I think to myself, well, you know, that's interesting. I wonder why they're not feeling like they're at home. I don't contradict because the third golden rule is don't contradict or argue with whatever facts somebody with dementia needs to use to, to make sense of what's happening around them. We just don't want to disturb the sense they're making. So when I hear I want to go home, I'm with all authenticity can join them in that. I want to go home too. Let's see what we can do together to make this feel more like home. And now we can move along as friends and companions um, versus somebody trying to say, well, this is your home or you are home or what home do you mean? Oh, well, I don't know. Like, I won't know what home I mean because if I check my album, because you asked me a question, I've got nothing. <laughs> so Asking questions to get clarification is also not helpful, especially when somebody's distressed. Yeah. Um, and then you asked another question besides home, and I don't even know what. Oh, it was. and that was about when somebody somebody calls you the wrong name. Like my oh, mom yeah. would call me her mom all the time. She would call my brother her brother, and yeah. you know we totally. I was okay with that. My brother was livid, you know, because yeah. we approached it differently. Yeah. So think about if if. Her intact photographs are way back here in the album. There's no way she would have a daughter that looks as old as you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you look more like her sister or her mom. <laughs> so she's matching back to a page back here where you possibly are reminding her of her mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, again, if it's all about the feelings, what we know is whether is somebody with dementia recognizes our name or our faces, they still are going to recognize the feeling we give them. We are a person who gives them that feeling of safety and security and beauty and kindness and love and, you know, that feeling that they belong and they can trust that all will be well. So the whole approach is around what are some practical ways that we can create that feeling of well-being and um, we work more with families specifically because the families have more work to do. They need mm -hmm. to learn the three golden rules, but then we also need to know specific history about this person because all those pages with facts and feelings are there. Let's use them in a way that helps the person with dementia cope with what's happening on today's page. And families are the ones who have the best access to that. So we say the expert leads the way the care companion holds the key. And then eventually, because we need to simplify and simplify and simplify with dementia, um, how do we simplify all this information that the family has down to a one page passport, speckle passport, that when this person might need more um, hired assistance or to move into a care community, we've got it down to a one page document that professionals can read and use in ways that are um, can sustain well-being. Wow, that, that's fantastic. You know, I, I'm going to mention a couple of things here because I think, again, like with me, I, I remember feelings more than I remember facts. 
but I think this is in our life more than what we realize. And I'll give, I'll just give another example of not just me. So I sold real estate for 25 years and I can't tell you how many people bought a house that had nothing to do with the specs that they wanted, but it reminded them of their grandparents' house. (laughs) Or I had one person buy a house because there was a picture over the fireplace that reminded them of home. And that was not coming with the house. They didn't even ask for it. I asked them, you do want to ask, oh no, that's too precious. They're going to want that. And they wouldn't even ask. But those, when those emotions hit like that, when we allow them in, yeah. I mean, it's really a pretty beautiful thing. And, and so I think this happens much more than what we realize, or when you might have a friend and go, well, that was out of the blue. Where'd that come from? It probably is falling back to some type of emotional impact that a lot of times we don't feel comfortable talking about, mm-hmm. or we don't even recognize within ourselves that this, that this is happening. Cause like you said, it, it's all on such an unconscious level. So mm-hmm. I, I think it's really pretty cool. I, I'm also thinking, gosh, I wonder if this would, and I know that you're already working with, with police and EMTs and things like that. But I'm, I'm really wondering, you know, there's this big push for mental health right now. And again, it's stepping into somebody else's reality in a different light and using different approaches. I, I would think that this could be a really, really powerful tool for, for that group as well. Um, because it's just so much more respectful. It, it's not this power struggle, which tends to escalate and, and makes a crappy day for everybody. And, you know, for an extended period, you can really get such great insight. And I think as a care partner, I love that you say that the person with dementia is the expert, because I truly with all my heart believe that. And I think that they have been ignored and belittled and pushed aside. Uh, Same with care partners. I I don't think they've been listened to because people believe they've got a degree. So they're the expert. Mm -hmm. I, I, and again, I think everybody has great information. We just have to be respectful of, you know, the different vantage points. And when you have people living in the trenches, I mean, who has more of a wealth of information Uh, To me, it's pretty black and white. And maybe that's because, you know, I'm not degreed. I, I am, you know, I'm not an academic. I'm not a researcher, but to me, it's just like someone's lived and breathed it. And you've read on this, you've studied on this, but you're taking, and I don't want to diminish their work. um, So, and which it might sound like, but they don't have the feeling side of this whole story. And that's the most relevant piece. Yeah. to quality of life and purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so we've got to mesh those together. You know, we, we've, we've got to see a coming together and understanding and an, an importance of that. I think that that's um, really, really exciting. You know, in the title, I said, you know, Speckles ready to take on, you know, the U.S. by storm. And I really, I mean, I really feel that way that not only, you know, are you prepared to do that, but it's so needed. It is a very different approach. And we've talked offline a zillion times. And I probably said this a zillion times on the air too. I can't stand the term person centered because I don't think, I don't think it, I don't think it's delivered. I think it, Mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, it is just verbiage. It's talking like we're doing what we know we're supposed to do, but it's not always delivered. And I like, of course, the relationship based care which I really think Speckle is all about. It, mm-hmm. It's about the relationship. It's about building safety. It's about creating joy and calmness and, and allowing a dignified life for everyone. And again, decreasing the stress and the burdens. I mean, gosh, take that out of anybody's life. It's a lot calmer. It's a lot mm-hmm. nicer place to be. Why would we not want that approach? Right, yeah. One of our speckle mantras is think normal first. Mm -hmm. And that's why we teach about the normal album first before we teach about dementia. But all the tools that we use, yeah, we have three golden rules, but we also have tools. You know, all those tools of um, not pummeling people with questions or listening to them or uh, the tool 
for the rule of don't contradict. Well, you know, we just kind of can keep our mouth shut and find it interesting and wonder why they might have said that and try to figure it out um, on our own, but not, you know, all of that works even with somebody who doesn't have dementia. So yeah. you're right about that kind of in the in the mental health circles too. Um, I always challenge the term uh, enter their reality because I, mm -hmm. I think that that's with speckle, we don't use that terminology. It's more like we consider what their album looks like mm -hmm. on their page because we're not wanting to enter their reality and stick them in the past, make them stuck mm -hmm. there. We want to <laughs> we want to consider their page. What facts are they using from their past and then help them cope in, you know, with what's happening today? Because they still have to live in today's world. But how can they do it in a way that they've got somebody with them? who's not um, disturbing the sense that they're making. So it's a so lot it's, of practical stuff like that too. So it's really adaption on both sides. Yeah. You know, because how we approach is going to affect their reaction. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think, again, so often we don't look at what triggers us. You know, we get into, especially nowadays, you know, with politics and just all the goofy stuff and, and pretty much any organization you look at, everything now is right or wrong. There's no meeting in the middle. There's no seeing how we got here. It's just right or wrong. And needless to say, that's not getting us anywhere except yeah. into, into, you know, the mud a little bit deeper. And this way, you know, you're, you're being respectful of the other person. You're, you are understanding that they are still there and able to participate at whatever level that is. And, and even when you had said, you know, when someone has that moment of clarity, when that, that photograph with the facts shows up, you really learn to appreciate the gift that that is mm -hmm. in the moment. I mean, those moments still melt my heart. My mom's been gone since 2014. But again, she lived with this disease 30 years and those moments of clarity, I mean, sometimes they were frustrating. Like when I was trying to get her not to wear a bra because it was too frustrating for her and I got her all talked into a camisole. And then my sister-in-law said, well, I'll take you shopping for a bra. And it was like, oh my gosh, here we go again. <laughs> and then my sister-in-law walks out and I got to deal with it all over. I mean, there were moments like that, but again, there was that connection for her at that time. Yeah. And and, uh, you know, other moments where, you know, she said my name and she hadn't said it in three years. Yeah. You know, where you just kind of go, wow, I didn't realize how much I missed that or a hug or whatever it might be. Because um, yeah. it's different for all of us. And we never know when those things are going to hit. But again, thinking back to, you know, talking with the true experts, those living with the disease. And just us as general humans, when we're stressed, things don't function as well for us. Yeah. Period. And, yeah. and they say when they're stressed, their symptoms increase. So if we can keep them calm and happy, maybe, maybe they'll have more full photograph moments. Yeah. You know, if, if they're not feeling so pressured and disconnected from us too, I don't know. Yeah, we talk about that when we're talking about normal and aging, mm -hmm. because stress, well, aging normally, you know, photographs will store the same way with the facts and the feelings. But boy, our ability to retrieve facts when we need, <laughs> it slows down. And so we, you yeah. know, we get the fact at three in the morning when it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Yep. But that's normal aging and stress will do that too. And so then you add that on top of actual blanks storing without the facts. I mean, it's, it's much harder than if you're right, than if we can keep it okay ish yep. <laughs> for, yeah. for our person and really for us. So yeah, yeah. it's, um, it's got relevance in so many ways and our, you know, the class, the classes, obviously we go more into it, but I, um, I did a workshop for some medical, like pre-med students a few, a couple of years ago. And I heard from one of them who's now um, finishing up med school. And he, and he sent me a text and he said, um, I just wanted to reach out and tell you that I had a patient today living with the very early stages of the condition. 
who came in for her, for resources for herself and her family. I told them about um, contented dementia, dementia together. Um, I wanted to thank, say thanks so much. I know my patient was appreciative. She had a very a big paradigm shift today because I told her that she knows her condition best. She is the expert and she gets to tell us what's most helpful for her. I, <laughs> I don't love think it. she had ever been told that before and she started to cry. Ah. So it's like, if we can get into the young medical professionals, I mean, that's the way to change the world. Oh, I, I agree. And, you know, for that person to be able to see the difference, mm -hmm. it's just massive. It's, you know, and we all want to, we all want to cure, but in the meantime, we have to learn how to care better yeah. uh, for people and, and realizing all this, when you were even talking about, you know, aging process and how we wake up at three in the morning, you know, I'm 63 now and I can't tell you more often than not, when I get together with my friends, I mean, we joke that it's a verbal puzzle of like, <laughs> who is that person who, no, no, it wasn't that, well, did, yeah. didn't they go here? And it was like, you know, six people join in and we still don't have it figured out. And then all of a sudden, you know, 15 minutes later, somebody goes, it was so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, this isn't something just dementia related. You know, I, I, I slow Granted. retrieval start yeah. using that phrase it's slow retrieval it's there yep <laughs> yeah we just don't get it but i think time. sometimes we try to make it so different and then we push it away well we don't need that it won't be useful and and, and i still say whatever's good for dementia is good for the whole world yes there's so many yeah. different applications and so many overlaying situations that it can help with. So mm -hmm. you know, I'm really excited about, about this. Now for you, what's the biggest obstacle of getting this new approach out in North America? Because I know people kind of get stuck in their ways. Well, and professionals, especially, and I can kind of bash us because I am one, <laughs> but we love to stick to our you know, biomedical model, and here's the latest treatment, maybe we should try this and that. But if if you kind of rise above the diagnostic line, as we call it, in speckle, if we really just treat it as the, a simple inability of our person living with dementia, no longer efficiently storing facts, but continue to store feelings, that it's so simple that I think professionals will shun that like mm, it's, dementia is more than memory, you know, all that. So I think that's part of it. Um, and I think that there's a lack of commitment among leadership in senior care, healthcare that, well, I do want you to come in and teach my staff, but can you do it in um, an hour? And then you get a call, you know, two weeks before it's like, well, make it a half an hour. <laughs> and, and you cannot do adequate dementia education with professionals in an hour. Um, but I get it because then you get the people where, well, what if I invest in them and they leave? I'm not going to invest that much time in these staff members because turnover is so high. To which I respond, you know, what if we don't invest in them and they stay? Um, either way, it's going to be difficult. Um, and I think people might stay more if they feel empowered to know some strategies that make a difference oh, and I they can agree. get some quick wins. And I did do a study with a place in Northern Colorado pre-COVID though, um, where their turnover rate was 86%. We did six months of intense training. So we did an introductory session for all the staff. We followed up at, at staff meetings and six months later, their turnover rate was down to 26%. So it was it was significant. Now with COVID, I don't know how that's changed. Um, but I just think we got to start somewhere. And, and I believe it's starting with, because this is a family driven model. We are working with the families and they're getting it and they're seeing huge successes. Their stress levels are decreased. Their ability to identify the positive aspects of caregiving increases. I mean, all that kind of stuff. They're going to be the ones, the consumers are going to be the ones to say, oh, well, I might admit my loved one to this care community, um, but we're doing it the speckle way. Yeah. I'm not staying away for two weeks. It doesn't mm -hmm. need to be traumatic. This is how we're going to do it. So those are the kinds of things I think it will be the 
consumers that change our industry, even in, in, in hiring in home care people too, that families can say, here's the information you need. I want you to respond, you know, learn about Speckle. For my loved one, this is how we're doing it. And I guess it's just going to change one person at a time or one family at a time, eventually one organization at a time. I don't see a fast track. Yeah, um, I what I find the culture. frustrating, and I mean, I've heard this since day one, since I stepped into this in 2009 was, well, this is the way we've always done it. <sighs> and it's like, yeah, and you're the first to admit it's not working. So <laughs> why are you continuing? Yeah. You know, um, and yet I understand, especially in today's age, they are worried about staff turnover. They're worrying about just covering shifts to even be able to offer yeah. training. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're worried about people living, leaving. But again, I'm with you. I think if they, if they feel heard and things are simplified and de-escalating, you know, they're able to de-escalate situations, that makes their job a lot easier. Oh my, yeah. A lot more comfortable. So it's kind of like, you know, where are your problem issues here? Mm -hmm. And, and how do you resolve that? And, you know, when you, and then when you did this over a six month period, I think that's one of the problems too. A lot of times people like, well, we're going to, we're going to send one person in as our lead and they're going to, you know, they're going to do the train, the trainer. Yeah. And they really haven't had the experience or maybe they're just not, um, Maybe they're a good learner, but they're not a good teacher. Yeah. Um, oh, and they, they don't allow others to kind of share their experience, which I, you, you do just a great job at that in terms of figuring out how does this go? And then also doing this over a six month period, you are there to support ongoingly. I mean, it's, it's in their face in a nice way, mm -hmm. but you are auxiliary staff coming in to support them. And when they are feeling, especially now, short staffed, when they're feeling extra support, that's huge. That's mm -hmm. a huge factor in why would I stay? Because now we're bringing back, and I think this has gone by the wayside in many cases, and I know there's a lot of um, CEOs that would argue with me, and I would say, go on your floor and you know do a shift or two, but we have taken the feeling out of care. And we have gotten so task oriented, we have gotten so factual, we have gotten so check it off, and we're not checking off, how are they feeling? Mm -hmm. You know, how is their day really going? And mm -hmm. that's, I think, what pulls most people into healthcare is they, they want to improve lives. And when they're left at the end of the day with a checklist, and maybe a slap on the hand, because they didn't get it done fast enough, that's really not the encouragement that they're looking for. And it's not fulfilling what they thought the job was going to be like either. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're touching on the whole compassion fatigue thing that we're seeing among people that certainly have feelings. They do mm -hmm. care. That is why they went into it. They're trying to do a good job and they're overwhelmed with staffing issues. So it's not like, yeah, I sure don't bash those people that are doing the day-to-day work or the leaders that are trying to have an organization that does it differently. There are people out there. Thank goodness for that. There really are people that want to make it better. It's just such a hard time. And I, man, I don't have the magic answer for that, but when you can help staff, um, just learn a different approach, like, um, one example, you know, we try to really help them pay attention to exact verbiage of, of the person with dementia. What, what are their exact words and or what, what really resonates with them? So, you know, like when they talk about a, a difficult situation and, well, we redirected him, that's mm -hmm. not good enough. I want to know, how did you redirect him? Tell me the exact words you used. Because to try to redirect him, no, you can't go in there. That's not redirecting that in a meaningful way. Redirection is, oh, Ralph, I could use some help over here <laughs> because Ralph is the guy that loves to go help people. And so it, just knowing that little bit about him or we had another lady, oh, Debbie, I need somebody to pray with me for my children right now. Boom, you could get her away from wherever she, she wasn't supposed to be. So knowing just key little pieces of information on a passport 
can make their life so much easier. And then you can talk to the staff about, you know, keep track every single day. What is one thing that went better today because you were there? And I think if, if we would encourage this, the direct care providers, the leaders to, to track that every day, at least they'd have a reason to come back to work tomorrow because they are making a difference. They're trying. It's just so, it's hard. I, oh, I, I agree. goes out to them too, man, it's hard. Yeah. I know when I used to go out and do the, the family by choice series that I had, we would educate the staff and the families on the same day, the same information, because mm -hmm. what I found was, you know, everybody, everybody affects one another. So if we're not giving them the same information at the same time, it just slows down the process. Yeah. But one of the biggest things that, that I always recommended, which it sounds like you're doing too, is log those good times instead of so-and-so hit so-and-so. Sally's purse is missing. Somebody had an accident. What, whatever it is, it, it, it always seems to be the negative. And then we wonder why quality control is all over us and what they're looking for. Well, we've trained them to look for the bad things. And not that we no. don't have to disclose those and not that we don't have to deal with those, but my God, even it out, you know, <laughs> talk, talk about the smiles and the laughter and the joy or the calmness or the, the beauty of a situation. I mean, it doesn't take long. And why aren't we spreading kindness? And, and then level? when there are difficult situations to tease them apart with the details of tell me the exact words, not judgment, not for judgment mm -hmm. or condemnation, but for, oh, how can we learn? Let's yep. try this. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, that didn't work. Okay, now let's try. <laughs> you know, it's like, we, it's not a mistake. We figure out what doesn't work until yeah. we figure out what does work. And that's the approach I would hope that we'd all take because not, I mean, it's humans working with humans, so it's never going to be perfect. Yeah. But wow. If we can make it better for the staff, better for the families, better for the people living with dementia, that's really what it is all about. And, and with Speckle, I think you, we can sustain lifelong well-being if you get everybody on the team who gets it. Yeah. But I think, you know, we've lived in a world so long full of judgment. And so that's, that's where their brain first goes. Yeah. You know, they're remembering the facts of, oh, I'm going to get written up, you know, not that, Hey, they want to use me as a resource. Yeah. That's a big, there's a big difference there in terms yeah. of how, how that is approached or allow, like one of the things I loved when I was in healthcare, when I was younger was they gave me permission to fail. They gave yeah. me permission to try new things. And, and, and they said, go for it. I mean, the worst that's going to happen is it's not going to work. And then you adjust and go forward yeah. versus waiting for something that you think is going to be perfect, probably will never be. And then it'll never get off the ground or tried. Yeah. You've done no good. You've, you've just spun your wheels and probably pushed people out of your organization going, you know, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we kind of say no right or wrong. It's just whatever works. Yeah. And, and like I said, it's like you go, huh, okay, well, isn't that interesting? We use the interesting tool. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> okay. But, it, but it's so true because yeah. every person with dementia is different. Every care partner, yes. every environment, every moment Everything. is going to yep. be different because that, that album is going to flip around. And so what worked today might not work tomorrow. I mean, we've all seen that happen and go, how is that? And it's like, well, Look, look at the album. Think about it. I would really encourage people to, to reach out to Cindy and learn more about this program. Sign up, you know, get some, get some classes, get some education, shift your dementia care. Again, it doesn't have to be complicated. No. And I think sometimes professionals think that it has to be complicated and it really doesn't. You know, the, the easier it is, the more it's going to be implemented. Come on. That just makes sense. Yeah. And, and anybody at really at any age can understand this, even small children oh, yeah. can, can understand this whole process. And again, there'll probably be some people like me going, well, I already have some of those holes and that's kind of how I've been all my life in, in these areas, <laughs> other areas look out. Cause I'm not going to forget a thing. <laughs> 
you know, but it, it is applicable in a lot of different ways. So you can reach Cindy by emailing her at Cindy, and that is C-Y-N-D-Y at DementiaTogether.org, or you can go to their website, DementiaTogether.org, and they're on Instagram and Facebook again. And that name on Instagram and Facebook is a little bit different because that was your original dementia friendly group, which is Dementia Together N-O-C-O for Northern Colorado. So thank you so much. Any, any last words of wisdom for us before we wrap up? No, just don't get stressed when you have slow retrieval, Lori. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) I try not to. I do my breathing and my meditation. (laughs) Oh gosh. Well, again, you're just such a joy to always have on the show. Keep up the great work. And I wish you nothing but the most success. Um, Uh, It's it's wonderful to see what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye now. For our audience, please like, click and share. This is, this is information that shouldn't be kept a secret. You know, we need to help her spread the word of the Speckle program, make everybody's life a little bit easier, more dignified. Bye now.